Now let's return to the standards framework for reviewing cluster studies. Step 5 is the first step in the review for evidence of effects on clusters. A cluster study that did not satisfy WWC standards for evidence of effects on individuals can meet WWC group design standards with reservations for evidence of effects on clusters if it meets two requirements. First, the individuals in the analytic sample must be representative of the clusters. If the analytic sample includes only a small fraction of the individuals in the clusters, a study cannot satisfy WWC standards for evidence of effects on clusters. This representativeness requirement is assessed in Step 5. Second, the study must either be an RCT with low cluster level attrition, assessed in Step 6, or demonstrate equivalence of the analytic sample of clusters, assessed in Step 7. Otherwise, the study does not meet WWC group design standards. Let's dig deeper into the first of the two requirements for satisfying WWC standards for evidence of effects on clusters, that the individuals in the analytic sample are representative of the clusters. When a study has a poor response rate at follow-up, it cannot satisfy WWC standards for effects on clusters. Suppose a study randomly assigned classrooms to conditions, but the school administered the outcome measure on a day when many students were pulled out of class for an assembly. The scores of the tested students may not represent how their entire classroom would have performed had all students been tested. So, the students in the analytic sample may not be representative of the classrooms. If so, then the study would not satisfy WWC standards for evidence of the effect of the intervention on clusters. The WWC uses a calculation that is very similar to the assessment of individual non-response in Step 3 to determine whether the response rate for individuals is high enough to be considered representative of the clusters. Like Step 3, the WWC assesses representativeness using the same WWC attrition standard discussed in the attrition module, which is Module 2. Just as in the calculation for individual non-response in Step 3, if a cluster were to drop from the study before follow-up, the WWC does not include the individuals from that dropped cluster when measuring representativeness. In other words, the WWC considers the representativeness of only the clusters included in the analytic sample. Also like Step 3, overall and differential non-response rates are calculated using the number of individuals in the analytic sample as the numerator those who contributed outcome data to the analysis. However, the denominator can differ from the one used in Step 3. In Step 3, the denominator could change depending on the threat of bias due to joiners. When assessing representativeness in Step 5, the denominator is always the total number of individuals in remaining clusters at follow-up, those who could have contributed outcome data to the analytic sample but did not. This means that study authors must provide some measure of the number of individuals within clusters at or near the time the outcome was measured to meet the representativeness requirement. For example, a study that randomly assigns schools to conditions and assess student outcomes at the end of the year might provide end-of-year school enrollment figures to use for the denominator. A study that is not representative does not satisfy WWC standards for evidence of effects on clusters. Therefore, it will receive a rating of does not meet WWC group design standards. Let's walk through an example of how to assess cluster representativeness. A cluster QED compared student achievement outcomes in five classrooms using a new reading curriculum and five using business as usual curriculum. At the time students received the baseline assessment, 130 intervention group students and 115 comparison group students were enrolled in the 10 classrooms. But over the course of the study year, 10 students left the classrooms, 5 from each condition, and 8 students joined the classrooms, all in the intervention group. 125 intervention group students and 91 comparison group students across the 10 classrooms completed the follow-up test and were included in the study's analytic sample. The study is reviewed under a protocol using the optimistic boundary for attrition and specifies that all joiners pose a risk of bias. 
Are the students included in the analysis of outcome data representative of the clusters? Let's organize the information from the example to sort out what we know about the number of students at baseline, at follow-up, and in the analytic sample. For demonstrating cluster representativeness, we need to know how many students were in the clusters at follow-up. In the intervention group, 130 students were in the classrooms at baseline, but five students left and eight students joined, a net gain of three students, giving us 133 enrolled in the intervention group classrooms at follow-up. In the comparison group, 115 students were in the classrooms at baseline and five students left those classrooms, giving us 110 enrolled in comparison group classrooms at follow-up. This means 245 students were in the classrooms at baseline and 243 at follow-up. The last column gives the numbers of students in the analytic sample. To assess representativeness, the attrition standard is applied to the numbers in the last two columns. First, let's assess overall representativeness. By applying the formulas for overall and differential attrition, we measure the unrepresentativeness of the individuals in the analytic sample of clusters. The denominator is 243, which is the number of students present in the clusters at follow-up. There are 216 students in the analytic sample, so the numerator is 243 minus 216, which is 27. Using the overall attrition formula, 27 divided by 243 is 11.1%. Now let's focus on the intervention and comparison groups individually to assess differential representativeness. In the intervention group, 133 minus 125 divided by 133 gives us 6.0%. And in the comparison group, 110 minus 91 divided by 110 is 17.3%. Then, differential attrition is the absolute value of the difference between 17.3 and 6.0, which is 11.3 percentage points. But the highest allowable differential attrition rate under the optimistic boundary for attrition when overall attrition is 11.1% is 10.9 percentage points. So, the students in the analytic sample are not representative of the clusters. The second requirement for satisfying WWC standards for evidence of effects on clusters is that the study must either be an RCT with low cluster level attrition or demonstrate equivalence of the analytic sample of clusters. Step 6 assesses the first part of this requirement, whether the study is an RCT with low cluster level attrition. Actually, this step is identical to the first step for the review for satisfying WWC standards for evidence of effects on individuals. So if the answer to step one was yes, then the answer to step six is also yes. If the study is an RCT with low cluster level attrition and met the representativeness requirement, then the study is eligible to meet WWC group design standards with reservations. Otherwise, the study must establish equivalence of the analytic sample of clusters to be eligible to receive this rating. The final step in the review to satisfy WWC standards for evidence of effects on clusters is to determine whether baseline equivalence was established for clusters, which is a requirement only for studies that are representative and are not RCTs with low cluster level attrition. This is the second way for cluster studies to meet the second requirement for satisfying WWC standards for evidence of effects on clusters. Equivalence of clusters differs from equivalence of individuals, which we discussed in step four, in three important ways. We'll talk about each of these in turn. First, the study must establish that the clusters in the analytic intervention and comparison groups are equivalent at baseline but not necessarily using the same individuals as those in the analytic sample. This means that in a study that randomly assigns schools to conditions, equivalence of clusters could be established for the same schools, but based on scores of a different group of students in those schools from an earlier year. Recall from the baseline equivalence module, which is module three, that the review protocol specifies the measures on which equivalence must be satisfied and any special rules for how equivalence must be established. In particular, 
the protocol will specify how a cluster study can establish equivalence of clusters. The review protocol might specify a different required baseline measure for establishing equivalence of clusters than for equivalence of individuals, or place restrictions on the samples that may be used. Let's consider a specific example. A study randomly assigned schools to conditions in summer 2014 and analyzed standardized test scores for grade 4 students in 2015. Suppose that the school administered the same standardized test to students in several previous years and to all students in the schools, not just to the grade 4 students. Let's visualize this example. Random assignment occurred in summer 2014 and the study analyzed grade 4 students in 2015. The review protocol may specify that equivalence could be established using one or more of three groups of students within the same schools from the analytic sample. One option is students in the same cohort from an earlier year, in this case grade 3 students in 2014. Most of the grade 3 students might be the same students in the analytic sample when they were one year younger, but for cluster equivalence, the two sets of students do not need to be identical. Although not necessary for this study because students were tested every year, it would also be acceptable to use students in the same cohort from an even earlier year, such as 2013, when the students were in grade two. A second option is students in the same schools from an earlier adjacent cohort, in this case, grade four students in 2014. Except for grade repeaters, the students in this sample will not overlap with the students in the analytic sample, but the key is that the clusters are the same. Some protocols also allow equivalence to be established using earlier non-adjacent cohorts, such as grade 4 students in 2013. However, when there is concern that the clusters might change substantially over time, using non-adjacent cohorts to demonstrate cluster equivalence might not be appropriate, and the protocol may not allow this approach. For example, when the intervention is a charter school network, the protocol might not allow non-adjacent cohorts to be used due to a concern that rules about enrollment eligibility may have changed over time. The students in the schools in prior years may have different characteristics from those enrolled during the study period. Again, the protocol will specify which of these samples are appropriate to use when establishing cluster equivalence. A second difference between equivalence of clusters and equivalence of individuals is that when determining whether baseline equivalence is established for clusters, the baseline standard deviations can be calculated using individual level data or cluster level data. If both are available, the WWC uses the individual level standard deviations. The third difference is that students with baseline data must be representative of the clusters contributing to the impact analysis at the time of the baseline equivalence assessment. This requirement is analogous to the representativeness requirement for outcome data described in Step 5. Just as the individuals contributing outcome data must be representative of the clusters, so must the individuals contributing baseline data. The approach here in Step 7 is identical to Step 5 except that the numerator is calculated using the number of individuals contributing to the assessment of baseline differences, which might differ from the number in the analytic sample. The denominator is the number of individuals in clusters at or near the time of the baseline assessment. Again, the calculation only includes individuals from within the clusters included in the analytic sample.